Okay. Uh, good evening. Is that loud enough? Good evening and welcome to the University of York's uh, continuing series of public lectures. Tonight we have Bletchley Park, did Twitter say Bletchley Park? And we actually have three people, so I'm going to steal a little bit of thunder. We have three to the price of one in a sense. Uh, we have Dr. Sue Black, whom I actually met without realising it about a year and a half ago, I should point out. And on either side we have the former CEO of Bletchley Park, Simon Greenish, and also Ian Salmon, who, after 28 years in Signals, has now the joy of taking over as CEO of Bletchley Park uh, very, very recently, six weeks ago. I'd like to say a little bit about Sue Black. Uh, this wasn't at the initial starting point for the invitation to this lecture. Uh, Sue has been instrumental in promoting women in computer science and women in engineering for a long time, founder of BCS Women's Special Interest Group, and a variety of other BCS uh, activities have arisen due to her efforts. Uh, I met Sue uh, probably about a year ago, actually, without realising it. We were at a search-based software engineering workshop. <coughs> we were actually working <coughs> together, and I was typing some notes. A day after I got back, I got a note saying, could you actually give me the notes you've been typing up? And then I said, it's Sue Black. I remember she'd been introduced as Sue. I hadn't registered for Black. <laughs> and then I came to the conclusion, <laughs> perhaps this Sue Black is the same Sue Black <laughs> as the person who's been responsible for these email messages I've been receiving about Fletchley Park. I then went online and found out it was. It was probably a good thing that I didn't actually realise that I'd met her, because for those of you who actually were the first of these public lectures, I did give a talk on Enigma. We wouldn't have spoken <laughs> about anything else. <laughs> so uh, without further ado, I will hand over to uh, Simon, who's actually going to get us off here. Take it away, Simon. Thank you very much indeed for coming. Thank you, John, and thank you for inviting us here. Uh, as John said, uh, you get three for the price of one tonight. Um, I'm, I'm a fraud because I'm no longer involved with Bletchley Park. Uh, I was chief executive for uh, some six years, but uh, I retired, was it f four weeks ago or six weeks ago? Six weeks ago. So I, I'm here uh, in support of Bletchley Park rather than as, as chief executive. Uh, as you'll see from the, uh, the, um, the slide, what we decided to do is to focus very much on the, the, the basic story, did Twitter save Bletchley Park? And it's a fascinating story. Sue, who seems to find her way to uh, every corner of the world, uh, has been an instrumental player in helping us to raise the profile of Bletchley, and she's going to tell the story of that. So my part is just to give you a little bit of background on Bletchley Park itself. If I can press the right buttons. A very brief history. I argue that Bletchley Park is one of the most important, uh, important sites of 20th century Britain. Uh, I think many of you who are here will know the story, but code breaking in World War II really did make an enormous impact on the outcome of the war. And I'm only going to, to give you one brief example. 1940, Britain was on the verge of starvation because the Atlantic convoys were not getting through. Very few people realised that we don't produce oil in this country to any extent, or didn't in those days. So all of the fuel to run the, the war and to run the economy was coming over the Atlantic, and a high proportion of it was being sunk. The only defence at that time was Bletchley Park, who were able to pinpoint where the U-boats were and to send the convoys somewhere else. And as a result of that, more convoys got through than otherwise would have done. There's no doubt about that. And perhaps that made the difference to whether Britain could stay in the war uh, at that early stage. From there on in, of course, the story becomes apocryphal because Bletchley Park played a, a part in every single campaign. Uh, nobody knew it was going on, but it was there. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that um, in the next few minutes. Of course, the other part of the story is that the world's first computer, Colossus, which was uh, developed to break the German high-grade code, uh, was produced at Bletchley Park and used. It was the first time a computer was used in anger to uh, actually do something faster and more effectively than a uh, human could do it. So Bletchley was not only an important player in World War II, but it was really where the electronic age started. But it's got a very strange history from that point on. The story was kept totally secret until about 1975, 
Uh, and for very good reason, because the government of the day did not want the rest of the world to know how effective Britain had been at breaking codes, and it particularly didn't want Russia to know. Uh, I, I think probably a very sensible decision at the time. So the fact is, the history of World War II, as written up till 1975, was largely incorrect because it missed out the uh, component of Bletchley Park. However, the story did start to come out in 1975, and it still is coming out. And the true impact of the work that was done there, I think, is still being recognised. This year is Alan Turing's uh, centenary anniversary year, and I think, uh, I argue, that Alan Turing was probably the second most important man of World War II, Churchill being number one. If it hadn't been for Alan Turing, you wouldn't have had Bletchley, and then you wouldn't have had the impact that Bletchley had on the war. So I think it's just my take on uh, really how important uh, Bletchley was. However, uh, the site itself uh, came up for disposal, and between 1992 and 2010, when the Bletchley Park Trust formed and took over the site, it struggled for survival. Uh, there's no doubt about it that Bletchley Park got to within that far of not being here on more than one occasion. And I think it was largely because the story had not been told and the true value of the, the historic value of the site had not been recognised. However, I think I can say, as, as part of the work that Sue has done and part of what we've tried to do to make sure that the, the value of Bletchley Park is really seen out there, uh, by the public and internationally. I think I can say that the site is now recognised as one of truly international importance. I'm not going to go through the story in, in detail, but here it is, the wonderful uh, mansion, uh, the architectural value of which has often been regarded as extremely low. I think it works in our favour now because nobody else built anything quite as awful as this. <laughs> but it is now the iconic uh, picture of a code breaking, uh, of the code breaking story. And here is the key part of the story. This is a photograph of a German Enigma machine. There were thousands of them produced. It was the main means of communication by most of the German forces and indeed the whole of the German e economic system. It went further than that, it went to Italy and basically all over the world. And it was the core system that Germany used, and it was this system that Bletchley broke. The next slide, I'm not going to go through in very much detail. You will be pleased to know. There will be an exam later. But look at the big numbers. The, the, the one that starts 158,184 with loads of noughts. That's 158 million, million, million. That's the number of options there are within the Enigma machine. The Enigma machine itself, if it was sat on this desk, would be about the size of a portable typewriter, about this sort of size. You can carry it. It's quite heavy, but you can carry it. It's battlefield quality, and it runs on a simple battery. Every different sector used a different setting for each day, and there were hundreds of those, so that every single day, Bletchley Park had to establish the exact settings out of that colossal number there for each one of those groups, and it had to do it quickly. And the, the great secret of Bletchley is that they managed to find a way of mechanising the process. The net result of that was that on an almost daily basis, the routine traffic from the whole of the war system was going through Bletchley and being decoded within a matter of hours, right across the whole of the military and economic system. And Germany never thought that that was possible. Just to give you a scale of how difficult it is, look at the bottom number. How many, how many of you have bought lottery tickets for expecting to win uh, the, the jackpot this Friday or Saturday? There's no hands. No. There's one up there. Well, I've, I, I, I've bought one. But we're not expecting to win, are we, sir? We're not expecting to win, are we? No. It'd be nice to. But look at the number there. It's 14 million to one. And you don't expect to win at 14 million to one. And yet they were dealing with 158 million, million, million. The story gets even more complex than that because when the teleprinter codes were developed uh, in the latter part of the war, the machinery for that was even more sophisticated and you can put an extra million on the back of that. So just a little figure to warm the cockles of your heart. If you were to start with a basic enigma and go through the options at a rate of 1,000 a second, you would still be doing it in 5,000 years' time. 
Germany never thought that that was breakable, and which is why that she was so successful. During the course of the war, it actually expanded enormously. It started with the huts, and you can see here huts three and six. Uh, both of these buildings are extremely important, and actually the photograph of hut six, which is the one on your left, uh, that's a photograph taken uh, several years ago. That's before we had to put tarpaulin all over it. In Sue's slides, you can see how the deterioration has, uh, has affected that building. But the iconic uh, codebreakers huts, there are a number of them left, and these are two of them. Naval huts eight and four. Never quite understood this, but the, the naval hut is about 500 yards away from hut four, which was its partner. And hut four is built immediately outside the rather nice library of the mansion building. So you look through the window, and approximately where the, row, the first row of seats are is this green wall of, of what is no better than a, a garden shed. And yet they had 55 acres in which to put these buildings, and they chose to put it there. But these are... Uh, four of the most important buildings, um, I think, of the site, and the site itself is, as I've said earlier, I think extremely important. Alan Turing himself worked in Hut 8, which is the one on, on the left here, and uh, something else which I think is quite an interesting, quirky story. The Battle of the Atlantic was effectively won in Hut 8, and you could hardly get further from the sea than Hut 8. <laughs> Some of the code breakers, including Alan Turing, uh, wrote to Churchill. Uh, to do that in wartime, I think, could be regarded as a fairly career-limiting move, but nevertheless, they did. A beautifully structured letter, basically saying, if you want this code-breaking program to work, we need resource. And Churchill wrote the famous um, memo saying, uh, action this day, give them what they want, and tell me when you've done it. And in due course, this is what happened. These uh, enormous um, brick blocks were built. There's acres of them. Uh, I've just chosen two uh, photographs, uh, block A, which is probably uh, the most important of them. And just a little quirky thing. If you look to your photograph, the photograph to the right, these are all standard buildings. So they're square with wings. They've got corridors and wings. One of the code breakers, whose name temporarily uh, uh, escapes me, said, I can't work without a bay window. So they built him one. I mean, when you think that's in the middle of wartime, 1942, when bricks, brick layers, and all the rest of it, all in desperate short supply, and they did that. I mentioned earlier the bomb machine, uh, sorry, the mechanization of code breaking. And this was done through the bomb machine, which Alan Turing was an absolute key part of developing. Now, this is the model of the bomb machine, and I've, I've shown this photograph simply because it's got a back and a front. But actually, the bomb itself is the two parts uh, put together. And what you've got here is a very sophisticated machine, which is essentially looking for uh, rotor settings. And it does it uh, in the same way that you would uh, if you're looking for a needle in a haystack. And probably, that is about the scale of the challenge you're talking about. And what it does, it, it actually asks itself questions. Is this a piece of straw, or is it a needle? And if it's a piece of straw, it discards it and goes on to the next one. And eventually, after it's discarded all the straw, what's left must be a needle. And electronically, that's what this machine is doing. And once the settings were changed at midnight, the very first message that came in for each group was hurriedly put through the process of developing a crib. The crib system then gave you the, the sort of spaghetti-like connections uh, on the right-hand side of the photograph. And then the machine was run. And within an hour or so, you had the wheel settings for that group for the day. That meant you could uh, decode all the messages that came in, more or less as they arrived, once you'd got the original settings. And that, I think, is the truly astonishing feat that Bletchley Park played. I'd go on to say that I think the bomb machine was probably the most important piece of technology of World War II. People talk about Spitfires, talk about radar, all these things, all terribly important. And there's loads and loads of things that come into that category. But the bomb actually played a part right from the start of the war, right to the end, in every single part of it. Uh, so these machines, there were 210 built. They weren't all at Bletchley Park, but these machines worked continuously throughout the war, uh, producing this, the information that allowed the Enigma uh, messages to be broken. 
I talked about the teleprinter codes in Colossus. This is a very rare photograph of the Colossus and its operators during the war. And Colossus has been rebuilt at Bletchley Park, and the photograph on the right is the rebuilt Colossus. It is an astonishing project. Colossus, the original Colossus, had 2,500 valves. This is the Mark II. Nothing had ever been done like that before. So you had a technology leap of some magnitude just to construct the machine. Nobody believed that thermionic valves could be reliable enough to work in that number. Uh, and yet they were, if you looked after them correctly. And the fact is, Colossus worked beautifully. And uh, one of the photographs that Sue will show you is of Captain Jerry Roberts. And he has sat in this very room talking about uh, decoding messages signed by Adolf Hitler Fuhrer. And it's, it, when, you, when you're in the same room as the person who's done that, it makes the hairs on the back of your neck uh, rise. Uh, I don't think Hitler would have been at all pleased had he known that we were reading his personal messages to his generals. But the impact of Colossus on the latter part of the war, particularly D-Day, was enormous. We knew, as a result of Enigma and Colossus, pretty near the complete disposition of German forces right the way from D-Day onwards. <coughs> now, why did Germany never realise? This question gets asked at every single uh, lecture that I give, so I always put a slide on because it saves at least one question. Uh, the UK worked on a need-to-know basis. Once Churchill had got involved, he said, I want a minimum number of people to know what's going on. And it was approximately 30 people. Only 30 people actually knew about Bletchley and the true uh, impact of what it was doing. The compartmentalization of Bletchley itself meant that the workers there did not know what was going on in other buildings. They were not allowed to talk about it. And I think the culture of the war was you didn't talk about it. So they didn't know. And uh, again, a little story of uh, one of the code breakers who's still alive, um, who worked with Alan Turing. Uh, and was a mathematician, and he was there the whole war. And I asked him, did he realize how important the work was that they were doing at the time? And he said, no. He said, they knew the work was important, but it wasn't until 40 years later when the story came out and he saw the other component parts that he knew nothing about, that he realized how important the work really was. I also asked him about Alan Turing, and uh, you know, was he the great mathematician that everybody says? And the answer was, yes, he was, but he was careless and he needed help. <laughs> the other very important aspect of Bletchley Park, which was very uh, thoroughly controlled, was nothing would ever be done that uh, couldn't be explained through other means. So whilst Britain may have known about the information, they would never act on it if it was put uh, Bletchley Park at risk. And there were huge efforts made to make sure that that never happened. They ran it very close once or twice, but... Uh, the fact is Germany was not looking, and had they been looking, they would probably have spotted it. But they didn't look, and it wasn't made obvious. So the net result is Germany never realized what was going on. We've had some quite important visitors um, over the years, and I, I put this photograph up. Uh, the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh came on July uh, of last year. It says 2000, 2011. That's right, yes. Um, <laughs> And she came to unveil the, uh, the memorial to the code breakers. Uh, and so it was a wonderful day. But it illustrates, I think, uh, how the importance of the site is now being recognized. And this is my last slide before I hand over to Sue. We've had some huge challenges. I, I mentioned that the trust has been in financial uh, difficulty uh, from 1992 onwards. It inherited 70 buildings many of them very large, and all of them in, in, in absolutely shocking condition. And it has no money. So what do you do with buildings that, that require millions of pounds? Running a museum is also extremely difficult because income generally comes from visitors and from what you earn through shops, etc. and it's never enough to run a proper museum site. That's why we have national museums who are largely funded by government. Bletchley Park has never had any support in that way. So it has genuinely struggled to deal with the rotten buildings, to deal with how do you manage to make the uh, operating uh, uh, losses, uh, how do you cover those, and how do you actually make sure that the, you could actually move forward and develop the museum. Ian is going to tell you all about that and the plans that we've got. But I'm going to uh, finish on 
what I think is one of the most important aspects of Bletchley Park and one of our greatest successes, the need to increase our profile. Five or six years ago, I think very few people really knew about Bletchley Park. The historians did. Um, people who were interested in, in World War II certainly did. But I think I can say now that Bletchley Park is, is in the, the psyche of, of uh, UK citizens on the whole. We've managed to get, I think, more coverage on national TV, national press, probably than all of the national museums in the UK put together over the last uh, five or six years. The impact of that has been absolutely enormous on visitor numbers, income, and our ability to bring in money to fix the rotten buildings. They are on, on route to all being fixed. And I think the future is looking very rosy indeed. Sue Black's part in this, starting four years ago, she kick-started the process of getting us into the public profile through the use of social media. And I think we've stole a march on pretty near all of the museums in the UK. We got there first. And I'd like to formally thank Sue for what she did at that time, because I think it was an absolutely critical part of the salvation of Bletchley Park and the fact that we are now in a much stronger position uh, with a real future going forward. That's my part. I'd now like to hand over to Sue to tell you all about how she did it. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me at the back? Yep, great. Um, thanks very much for coming this evening. It's, uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. I feel I'm, I'm still blushing from what Simon just said, so I'm a bit kind of, oh, thank you, Simon. Um, so, oh, how social media helped Bletchley Park. Um, so I'm going to start um, from kind of where the story starts for me. In 2001, I was a, a PhD student at uh, South Bank University studying uh, software engineering, and um, I, uh, going to conferences, I found myself, um, I guess, kind of a bit isolated with uh, not so many uh, other women in, in software engineering around. Um, so I set up a network called BCS Women uh, to kind of put women in computing uh, into a, an online network together to kind of bring women together. And so it, it was as chair of that group that I first went uh, to Bletchley Park. So I went up for a British Computer Society meeting and uh, I was in the meeting all day and then after the meeting went for a walk around uh, the site at Bletchley Park. Didn't really know that much about it. I kind of knew code breaking, um, you know, wasn't really sure what there was that was there but I was itching to kind of find out what was there. Um, and so while I was walking around, I bumped into a guy called John Harper who was rebuilding the bomb machine that uh, Simon showed on a previous slide. So I started chatting to him and uh, talked to him about what he and, and the other uh, people crowded around this half a bomb machine, as it was at the time, were doing. Um, and so he, he started telling me all about the bomb machine, uh, that they were rebuilding it and uh, that it, you know, it, it took them, I think, eight or ten years in the end to actually rebuild the bomb and a team of about 12 people. Um, so he told me all about that and then asked me why I was there. So I said, well, I'm here <coughs> representing this group that I set up, uh, Women in Computing. So he said, oh, did you know that um, more, the ha more than half the people that worked at Bletchley Park were women? So I was like, no, because I, I guess in my head, even though I didn't know, I kind of thought it was... 50 blokes in tweed jackets sitting around smoking pipes doing a bit of code breaking. It never occurred to me that there were any women there. Um, so, so I thought that was really cool. So I said, well, how many people actually worked here? And um, he said there were about 10,000. And I thought, oh, my goodness. So, you know, I just had absolutely no clue that it was that many people and that there were more than 5,000 women involved. Um, so I went away that day thinking to myself, I must do something to highlight the contribution of women at Bletchley Park. Um, so I spent the next couple of years trying to raise funds uh, to, to do something around that. And it was um, at the launch of what came to be a project called the Women of Station X that uh, I met Simon Green Greenish, who's just been speaking to you. Um, 
here, here we are at the launch. Um, I gave my talk, you know, about why, why I was at Bletchley Park, why I thought it was important, about the, the Women of Station X project. Um, and then Simon gave a talk about Bletchley Park, um, which was, you know, kind of similar to the stuff that he's just said, but then he also said um, that they, they were teetering on a knife edge financially, that they didn't get any government funding, no real external funding, and most of the funding came from um, gate receipts, so people going to visit. And, you know, that he was worried about um, the future of Bletchley Park with so little money. So I um, went away from that, um, you know, with it kind of in the back of my head, thinking, well, that, that's not right. Surely, you know, that shouldn't be happening. Um, and uh, it was at uh, a reception, I think about a month later. So fast forward a month, I went up to Bletchley Park again to a reception there. And I think it was then as part of a, a proper, like, guided tour of the site that I was standing outside um, Hut 6 with one of the veterans that had worked at Bletchley Park talking about all the major achievements that had happened in that hut. Um, and, you know, it was then that I heard things like, you know, the fact that um, the work done at Bletchley Park was said to have shortened the war by two years and that 11 million people a year were dying, so potentially saving 22 million lives. You know, and I, I heard that, and I was standing there listening to these amazing stories, and kind of in the back of my mind, I've got, you know, the words of Simon ringing in my ears, you know, we've not got enough money, uh, we're teaching on a knife edge financially, and I just thought, well, that's terrible. You know, I've, I've really got to do something about that. Um, so I went away uh, that night, and because at the time I was head of a computer science department at University of Westminster, uh, I emailed all the heads and professors of computing in the UK um, uh, with, a, with a photo of Hut 6 saying, uh, we must do something about this. Um, there was a petition on the number 10 Downing Street website, so I urged everyone to sign that and was amazed when I checked the petition, because you could see the names of who'd signed it a few hours later, to find that, you know, loads of really famous to me, people I look up to, heads and professors of computer science around the country, had signed the petition. So that kind of um, gave me confidence, I guess, because I'd, I'd thought that, that this was wrong. This was something that I had to do something about. But seeing lots of other people that I really respected and knowing that they felt the same way really gave me the kind of the confidence to, to carry on. So, um, so what we did... Um, so after that, sorry, I went, I went to the reception with a colleague, John Turner from Westminster. And so we were talking about what can we do, what can we do about this. Um, and so he said, why don't we write a letter to the Times to highlight the situation? Because obviously lots of people feel the same way and we really must do something about this. So um, John drafted a letter. I sent it round to all the heads and profs asking them to sign it um, for us to send in to the Times. Uh, and so in 2008, we sent the letter into the Times um, uh, yeah, 2008. So uh, we drafted the letter, we sent it around, we got 97 profs and heads of computer science agreeing to uh, who, who actually signed it. And, um, and then I thought, well, we've got this letter. I need to get more publicity. How can I get more publicity? So I emailed all the journalists that I knew, which were probably about five. It wasn't uh, lots and lots at the time, um, saying, I think I've got a good story. Uh, we need to save Bletchley Park. Uh, all the heads and profs have signed this letter. What do you think? Um, and uh, I also set up a blog to kind of uh, try and create awareness, uh, uh, somewhere to uh, point people to that was uh, telling the story of, of what I was trying to do. So uh, luckily one of the journalists, Rory Kefflin jones came back to me and said that he was really interested in the story. Um, and basically what happened was I got a phone call one day asking me to go up to uh, Bletchley Park so that he could interview me. And then that went out on the BBC News um, and Today programme. It kind of, it's like my world just suddenly went crazy from one day to the next because um, on the Monday I, um, I hadn't really, you know, done that much media work. And then suddenly the next day I was on the, t there was a recording of me on the Today programme. I was on BBC News, I had 
friends in, in Canada and Australia Facebooking me saying, I just saw you on TV, what's going on? Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, my life went a bit crazy and I was kind of uh, all over the media that day, which was great. So, so that was kind of, that's the, the traditional way, I guess, of raising awareness. You send a letter to the Times, you try and get stuff on TV. And so that worked to a certain extent because that, that, you know, that did get some good feedback and some press coverage. But what happens is you kind of get a peak and then straight down, you know, straight down into a trough, really, because the next day it's all different news and lots of people have just forgotten about um, the news from the day before. So it was after that that um, playing around uh, with Twitter, so this is like the end of 2008, I think, um, it, it suddenly dawned on me that here was a way that rather than just kind of getting these peaks and troughs of, of trying to get awareness uh, raised, w we could use it to create a community, to find people that might be interested in Bletchley Park, um, and, and to kind of get the message out in a more kind of sustained way, I guess, and try and build a community around Bletchley Park of people that were interested um, rather than just kind of broadcast. It's much more interactive. So in this photo, you can see, so um, Simon was talking about Jerry Roberts. This is Captain Jerry Roberts here with a holding a valve and Simon's stolen my line, which I was... <laughs> because I was going to tell you about, you know... Um, it, it, one of the things that's been really amazing being involved with Bletchley Park is meeting the veterans because they're, they're all just really, really cool people um, who've done some really cool stuff that they had to keep quiet about for a really long time. Um, and so Jerry Roberts is one of those guys and uh, he gave a lecture at UCL um, and here he is, you know, talking about this valve. Um, and uh, just, it's true, just to sit in the room with him telling his story of what he did and then to hear him saying, and so I decoded this message, and at the, you know, I uh, translated this message, and at the end of the message, it's, it was signed, Hitler, Führer. It's just like, oh my God, I've met someone who was, you know, translating Hitler's secret messages. So just very cool people. Um, so uh, this is January 2009. So I realized that, that Twitter uh, had potential to help raise awareness of Bletchley Park. So the guys at the top, um, documentally in size more, and uh, there I am with um, Kelsey Griffin, who's at Bletchley Park on Twitter. Um, I, I wanted to get social media people that I'd met up to Bletchley Park so that they could kind of get that same feeling as me. And I think when, when you... Actually, how many people here have been to Bletchley Park? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> wow. That's wonderful, because it's funny, when I first started talking about it, I'd, I'd say that, and I'd get about, well, maybe about 5 or 10%, so that's, re I mean, obviously you're interested anyway, um, but um, that's really nice to see that. Um, so, do you agree with me? If you actually go up there and go around and see it, then you, you kind of, you really get the story a lot more. Okay, lots of people nodding, that's good. Um, so, what I wanted to do was to get these social media people um, up to Bletchley Park, so they could see Bletchley Park but also to get the people working at Bletchley Park to interact with these people that knew all about social media. Um, and so these are photos uh, from that day uh, here. And um, uh, documentally, who's the, the guy um, on my right uh, at the top? Uh, set Bletchley Park up on Twitter, so set up the accounts, talk to... Uh, Kelsey at Bletchley Park about how to tweet and stuff and, and so she's been doing that uh, with great success ever since. So, so I got people, social media people up to Bletchley Park. They, they got excited about Bletchley Park. Bletchley Park got excited about them and so, you know, everything was kind of moving along. So, and they were interacting with each other. So th then I was thinking to myself, so what's the best way to get, you know, to kind of continue getting the message out there using Twitter? Um, so, one night in, uh, I think it was January, February 2009, um, Stephen Fry, who most people... Oh, how many people are on Twitter, actually? Okay, that's not bad, about half. <laughs> um, I saw Stephen Fry tweet a picture um, of himself stuck in a lift uh, in Centre Point in London. And uh, because... One of the first people usually that you follow on Twitter is Stephen Fry because he's so well known and he's funny and 
all that stuff. Um, so I saw a picture of Stephen Fry stuck in the list, and I thought, Stephen Fry, he's the ideal person. He's clever. I'm sure, you know, he's interested in history. I'm sure he'll be interested in Bletchley Park. Quickly Googled him in Bletchley Park and found that, um, he, you know, there were quotes from him saying stuff about, positive stuff about saving Bletchley Park. So I thought, okay, that's cool. So I'll try um, tweeting him and see what happens. And so I sent him a few uh, tweets. And then the next morning, I was amazed to find that he tweeted a link to my blog and saying we must save Bletchley Park. And so uh, my blog from having the normal 50 hits a day at the time which I was getting, which I thought was okay, that day got 8,000 hits. <laughs> <laughs> and at that time, he had 220,000 followers on Twitter. I haven't looked recently, but I know it's in the millions now. So, you know, it's amazing. And so uh, I quite like this uh, so you can see the, uh, the amount that um, I got tweeted or Bletchley Park got tweeted uh, going up there. And also the bit on the, on the bottom um, slide is, um, bottom part of the slide, shows uh, the people that are most retweeted on that day. And I'm first and Stephen Fry is second. <laughs> so it's like, that will never happen again, but it happened on one day in 2009. And so uh, Stephen Fry uh, has been very supportive he came up to uh, Bletchley Park for the day in, I think, May that year because he was filming um, something in New Zealand for quite a long time. So we were all desperate to get him up there. Um, and then he came up to the day in May 2009. And uh, what was really interesting about that was that he was exactly what, what I think for all of us, what we all expected him to be. Within five minutes of being in the room, he'd said a word that I'd never... Yeah, I think I'm reasonably educated... Uh, he said a word that I'd never heard before in my life. And, uh, you know, I was, like, Googling under the desk trying to find <laughs> out what he actually meant. So, and, and he's wonderful, an absolutely wonderful guy. So, like I was saying earlier, one of the, the, the best things about being involved with Bletchley Park has been meeting the veterans. And uh, this photo is from a couple of years ago. There's a, an annual reunion for veterans in September every year at Bletchley Park. And um, I was lucky enough to get invited to the the dinner before the reunion, the night before the day of the reunion a couple of years ago. And so I went in and I sat down with what basically was a table of old ladies. Um, because, of course, everyone that, that worked there is now, I think, 80 or over. And, um, and so chatting to them over dinner, I really wanted to know what it was like for them, you know, being involved in all of that stuff. Because, you know, lots of them were about 18 um, or, or 20, they were young girls working there. And I was interested in, you know, sort of an 18-year-old's perspective on what was going on and what they enjoyed and didn't enjoy, um, kind of being part of that whole thing. And um, I said, so, so what sort of things did you get up to outside of, of your time there? And uh, one of the ladies said, do you remember that time when we nicked the vicar's bicycle to go to a dance? And I, <laughs> and I thought, yeah, this is the kind of stuff I wanted to hear about. Um, and then one of the other ladies said, um, uh, oh, well, we were, uh, lots of us were billeted out at Woburn Abbey. And um, in the summer, we used to go up onto the roof and sunbathe topless on the roof. And um, the RAF pilots used to get into trouble because they used to come and fly down low over the <laughs> roof to get a good look. <laughs> and I thought, you know, when you, when you look at, at people that are 80 plus, that's not what you think about. But of course, you know, we were all young once. And uh, yeah, I absolutely love those stories. And, and I had a fascinating evening talking to them. So one of the things I really wanted to do was to get Bletchley Park kind of on the international um, museum circuit and kind of introduced to other people working in museums all around the world. So um, I thought it would be a good idea to write a, a paper about uh, social media, did Twitter save Bletchley Park? Sorry, can Twitter save Bletchley Park? Um, so uh, with Kelsey Griffin, who's Director of Operations, and uh, Jonathan Bowen, who's uh, an academic colleague, we wrote a paper about using social media um, and Bletchley Park and uh, sent, sent it in uh, and were, you know, waiting with great anticipation to see if our paper got accepted. Uh, and then it did get accepted, so we got very excited. And then I realised we had no money to go, and it was in Vancouver. Um, so I wasn't sure what to do. So I, so I tweeted uh, to everybody, our paper's been accepted, you know, it's great. Um, 
you know, like the good news and the bad news, but the bad news is we haven't got any money to go there, and I can't ask Bletchley Park to now pay for us, you know, Bletchley Park hasn't got enough money. Um, so uh, friends on Twitter said, we'll set up a, a Just Giving page, um, and uh, I'm sure the community will give you the money to go, and we needed two and a half thousand pounds. So after a bit of persuasion, uh, I did set it up, and within two weeks, friends, uh, people on Twitter gave us two and a half thousand pounds. I was absolutely amazed, but uh, oh, I don't know. I mean, words fail me really. I can't. I can't tell you how wonderful that was, um, and how great the people are here that gave us the money, um, especially top centre, Mr. Grasshead, who I think gave us gave us the most money <laughs> out of all those donations. So thank you very much, Mr. Grasshead, and, and everybody else on Twitter. Um, Twitter has never kind of failed to, oh, I don't know, kind of inspire me, and um, well, it's, obviously it's not Twitter, it's the people that you manage to connect to through Twitter, but, it, but it's just, it's incredible, um, the kind of uh, great things that people do and have done for Bletchley Park. So fast forwarding a bit more to about 18 months ago, um, I don't know, if, did you all see the stuff about the Turing papers in the press um, about just over a year ago? So uh, some of Turing's off prints were up for auction at Christie's and uh, that was spotted by Kelsey Griffin who tweeted about it saying uh, some of Turing's papers are up for auction. Um, and I didn't see that at the time. A, a guy called Gareth Harfacre saw that tweet and decided to set up a Just Giving account to raise money to try and buy the papers for Bletchley Park. So the papers were up for auction for 300 to 500,000 pounds, um, which is quite a lot of money. Um, and uh, Gareth managed to raise 20,000 pounds from public donations, which is an absolutely amazing thing to do. Um, I was kind of keeping an eye on what was going on and wondering if I could help in some way. And uh, I saw that after, uh, sorry, with about a week to go before the auction, he'd raised £20,000. Um, and I thought, so he's probably not going to get up to £300,000 by next week, so what can I do to help? Um, and I was at a, a talk at uh, Nesta in London where Megan Smith, one of the Google vice presidents, was speaking. I went up to her at the end and said, basically, can you help? and uh, explain the situation, and she said, send me an email. So I went away thinking, oh, nothing's going to happen after that. Um, but uh, luckily it did, so she was actually interested. Um, coincidentally, a guy called Simon Meacham from Google uh, got in touch with me via Twitter, saying he wanted to help Bletchley Park the next day. Um, and I put the two of them in touch with each other, and basically over the next five days, uh, they managed to raise a uh, £100,000 donation from Google, um, which meant that Bletchley Park going into the auction had £100,000. Um, so I was hoping that not many people would bid and, um, and that £100,000 would be enough, even though the, uh, the list price was three hundred to 500000 um, So I went into the auction and sat there, knowing that Bletchley Park had £100,000. And um, I don't know if you've ever been to an auction somewhere like Christie's, but it's, uh, it's a bit of an uh, adrenaline rush. It's very exciting. All these things getting sold for, for more money than I'll ever have. Um, and, um, and really, really quickly as well. And so uh, I sat there with £100,000 in my head and the auctioneer, when, when the lock came up, the auctioneer said, and the bidding starts at £165,000. <laughs> so I thought, oh no. <laughs> And then after about 10 or 15 seconds, it was all over and I didn't know what had happened. But it turned out that it had not met the reserve price, which we didn't know what that was. Um, so, you know, we kind of came out from there and uh, I didn't really know what was going to happen because they hadn't sold. And, uh, yeah, what, what, I was just confused about what had happened and what would happen and would the papers go to Bletchley Park and kind of... So I, I went down to meet Simon Meacham um, because I hadn't met him yet, because he was in the States, uh, and chatted to him about it. Um, but what did happen was that over the course of the next couple of months, uh, Simon Greenish managed to uh, get people and organisations, I think it's a Heritage Memorial Fund, um, to put up the rest of the money. And, uh, and so luckily, Bletchley Park managed to secure the Turing Papers. Um, 
Paper, which is wonderful. There we go. Chewing Paper Safe for Bletchley Park um, on my blog. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm very relieved that they did. And this week uh, there was the, the unveiling by James May on Monday at Bletchley Park of the Chewing Papers, um, which was a great event. So one of the, the, the great things that's happened for me through Twitter is I've kind of become, I suppose, a minor celebrity, only in certain circles. But um, I guess quite a lot of geeks know who I am now. And, uh, and that's, that's quite weird when I get recognised in the supermarket. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's also quite cool when I get to hang out with people like Robert Llewellyn. Um, so Robert Llewellyn approached me. I how many people know about carpool? Oh, not many. <laughs> um, so carpool is, uh, who, who knows Robert Llewellyn, actually? Sorry. <laughs> okay, cool. So, so Robert Llewellyn's an actor. Um, he's uh, Crichton in Red Dwarf. And what else is he? I can't remember. Oh, God, I've just admitted that on camera. Uh, <laughs> Robert Llewellyn's a superstar. Uh, <laughs> he, he's, uh, so he's got this thing called carpool, which basically is he drives people around usually celebrities, uh, but quite, usually quite, kind of, quite a lot of geeky people, drives him around in his car and just chats to them as he's driving around. And he drives around in a, a Prius. Um, so he emailed me asking me if I'd like to uh, go on carpool. So I was like, yes, please. Uh, and then he said, well, just you know, work out where you want me to take you. Because basically, he picks you up and he drives you somewhere and chats to you along the way and then edits down the, the uh, film. He's got like four or five little cameras inside the car, um, and produces uh, Carpool, which is a video which he sticks up online, but it's also uh, the more famous people like Stephen Fry and Joe Brand um, are on TV. You know, it's like a TV series as well. Um, and so for weeks I was thinking, where, where, could, where could Robert Llewellyn take me? And it was only like with a few days to go that it suddenly dawned on me, Oh, Bletchley Park. <laughs> Why don't I get him to take me to Bletchley Park? And so I emailed and said, Bletchley Park. And he was like, yeah, why didn't we think of that? So I don't know why we didn't think of that, but we didn't. But anyway, so I had a great day um, with Robert. He drove me up to Bletchley Park. Uh, and then Simon did a whistle-stop tour of about 45 minutes, I think it was. Um, and then drove me back to London, which was really cool. He's such a lovely guy and a great supporter of Bletchley Park. So this is my last slide. Um, one thing that's been great for me is to kind of see the progression of what's happened. So Google got involved around uh, helping with the Turing papers, and they've, they've continued their relationship with Bletchley Park, um, which has been great. So last summer, we, um, I helped with uh, the organization of a garden party at Bletchley Park. Um, and it was, I don't know if you remember the day last summer when it, it just rained all day. Um, so it was like lots and lots of sunny days, then torrential rain on one day, and then lots and lots of sunny days afterwards. Well, that day of torrential rain was our garden party at Bletchley Park. Um, so uh, it was mainly inside the marquee that you can see there, um, but it was absolutely a lot of fun. Um, and yeah, we got 400 people coming along to that, which I think, considering the weather, um, was absolutely amazing. Um, and uh, that's uh, Simon Meacham there with me. Um, he flew in from India to come to the garden party and then flew off to the States. I don't know how he does it. Um, but um, that, was, that was a really great day and it was nice to see. Um, it was kind of like a celebration, I think, of, of kind of how... Um, just kind of how Bletchley Park is kind of evolving and how lots of geeks now kind of go up there and... I don't know. It was it was a really lovely day, and uh, and like I said, I'm really I'm really happy that the the relationship with Google is continuing uh, continuing and continuing to grow, um, and uh, you know I look I look forward to that kind of increasing, and also hopefully to other companies coming in and getting involved with Bletchley Park. Right. So I think that's the end of my bit. Yes, it is. So thanks very much for listening. <coughs> Ian's now going to talk to you about the future of Bletchley Park.
Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, my name is Ian Standen. I'm the current CEO of um, the Bletchley Park Trust. And as introduced at the start, oh, this is week six in the job. So um, it's been a very steep learning curve over the last six weeks. And what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about what the future lies um, ahead for Bletchley Park. As Simon said, we're a site that's got all sorts of old buildings dating back to the Second World War, many of them still in um, not brilliant condition and requiring quite a lot of work um, to make them better. What Simon did allude to is the fact that through his efforts over the last couple of years, we've managed to secure heritage lottery funding um, support for the site. We have a seven and a half million pound project, Project Neptune, which is about to kick off this year and should deliver by the end of um, 2014. Um, like most heritage lottery funding projects, um, part of the money is provided by the lottery and the rest we have to raise by our own efforts. Seven and a half million pounds, about five million pounds coming from the lottery and the rest coming from us. And the good news is we're almost there. We're about 450k short at the moment. So we're on the last push at the moment to get that money. Once we've got it, hopefully in the next couple of months, we'll be kicking off the project. And what I'm going to cover in the next couple of slides is what that project will mean to the site um, and also look further forward to where we might be going over the next five to ten years and the continuing battles we've got to fight to preserve the rest of the park. So, good to see lots of people have actually been to the park. Um, this diagram shows you the park, and I'll use it just to talk about some of the themes underlying it. Um, this is the mansion, for those who have been there, the big lake out the front, um, and this is the entrance you come in. The philosophy we've taken with this project is at the centre of the park, outlined there in the green line, will be the sort of the museum part of the park, and it'll be traffic-free. We'll push the traffic out to the sides, um, and it'll allow us to take the centre of the park back as best we can to give it the 1940s feel. Keep the traffic away, get rid of things like modern street lights, get rid of um, lines on the road, and take it back to the feel. Restoring some of the landscaping to back what it was like um, during the war, and preserve the buildings within the site and try and take them back to what they would look like, look like in 1940. Sorry, I'll point out first of all, at the bottom end of the site, this block C, but again, for those who've been into the site on Sue's last slide, it was in the top right-hand corner. For those who've been into the site, it's a horrid, um, dirty-looking block right by the entrance. This will become a shiny new visitor centre in which we'll have, very importantly, um, an overview exhibition of the site. One of the big problems with a site like Bletchley Park, unlike many other museums where you have lots of artefacts, our artefacts are few and far between for many reasons. Um, most, not least of which is at the end of the war, a lot of the stuff was destroyed because Hit, um, Churchill wanted to preserve the secrecy of the place, or it was sent off to GCHQ, which formed out of what went on here in the war, um, and was kept by them. So there's not many artifacts around, lots of buildings, um, and they need to be interpreted. Again, for those who've been on a tour recently, you will go on guided tours around by some very knowledgeable guys around the site. Um, but the problem with that is it's a bit hit and miss. So what we're trying to do with this is to have a exhibition right at the start where everybody gets a story, they understand the importance of Bletchley Park, understand when, what went on there, and then they can go explore the rest of the park, um, taking in and filling in the gaps. So this building here, Block C, was the card index during the war, if you like, the search engine that drove the intelligence business in Bletchley Park. And this building we've taken back to what it was like during the war. At the moment, it's a derelict building with lots of little offices in it because that's what it was used for between the end of the war and 1990-odd. Um, and we're going to take that back to what it was like in the war. So an open plan office, uh, and we're going to re return the place to overhead ducting, blackouts on the windows, bare walls, lino on the floor, um, and make it feel right from the word go when you walk in the door, you're in back in the 1940s. It'll have its exhibition, it'll have the obligatory shop, coffee shop, all that sort of stuff to handle visitors when they first arrive on the site. This is what it looked like from the outside. So brand spanking new entrance, um, coach parking out the front there, all the good stuff you might expect from a good, good visitor entrance. And inside, uh, these are artists' impressions that give you a feel of what, you, what you're, you're going to see. Yeah, the coffee shop, admissions here. And you can see the feel for the building here, lino on the floors, overhead ducting, what have you, to give you the feel right from the word go. Simon also showed you pictures of the huts, the iconic huts right at the, the heart of the, the site that were used right from the start of the war, and these need preserving. As you probably saw from Simon's and, um, pictures, without the tarpauling on, Sue's with the tarpauling on, the tarpauling is still on at the moment. These buildings are in desperate need of restoration. 
Um, and we're going to sympathetically restore these, which means that we have carpenters in, they'll take a plank out, look at it. If it's fit for purpose, it goes back in. If not, they'll replace it with a new one to try and keep the buildings preserved as much as they were like in the war. We'll also build the blast walls back around them here. During the war, these were here to stop um, shrapnel from bombs that landed on the site hitting the buildings. The site was very lucky. It had one air raid on it very early on in the war, um, which was thought to be a, a German plane that strayed off route and was getting rid of its bombs. Other than that, the Germans didn't know that the place was there and didn't bomb it, which is quite fantastic. But those blast walls are there, and they'll be restored. So the overall fear of the site will be taking it back so to the 1940s and preserving those buildings. But these are only a very small number of the buildings. There's still much more to do, and that will be the, the, <clears throat> the work of subsequent projects beyond this one. And the project's not just about um, buildings. A proportion of the money is about exhibition space. Inside these buildings, because they're listed, like most of the buildings on the site, we can't do much inside them. They've got lots of little rooms. So what we have to do on these ones is what they call light touch um, interpretation. So people will move through them quite quickly. They'll go through, but they'll get the sights, sounds, smells, or what it was like to work in one of the huts. So you'll get um, projected images on the walls, soundscapes of people working, and the smells of the coke fires going on. So hopefully people will be find it evocative and understand what it was like. Um, and that, as I said, is the, the heart of this particular project. Underpinning it, though, there are three strands of work. Um, one is learning. As anybody who's been involved with heritage lottery projects in the past will know that the heritage lottery is very keen about us outreaching our product and making sure that people understand what the story is. So a large chunk of this is making sure that our learning processes, and whether it's learning we deliver through galleries, learning we deliver through our education program, or indeed the development of other ones like youth programs, adult education, those sort of things are embedded in the project. So that's an important part of it. Excuse me, I'm just going to wet the whistle. The second strand is interpretation. I've touched a bit on the, the light touch interpretation that goes on in here, but all the rest of what we do needs to come up to modern museum standards. Again, for those who have been, if you're lucky enough to see the Turing exhibition, it is up to that standard, but most of the rest of what we've got isn't to the required standard, and there's a lot of work to be done to make sure we bring those up to modern, modern standards. That means increased use of um, interactive displays, audiovisual um, interpretation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there's going to be a fundamental shift in terms of how I interpret our site, but clearly mindful of keeping the, uh, the quaint quirkiness that is the Bletchley Park site, making sure we don't lose touch with our, our heritage and our, and our background. And the third strand <coughs> is about training, making sure that we train our people um, to do the job properly, making sure we nurture them, take them forward. Again, for those who've been to the site, like many um, heritage sites, we rely a lot on volunteers. We have a large volunteer contingent who run um, the business, um, the, the customer-facing business, most of the time. And a part of this training, we're making sure we have an appropriate um, volunteer accreditation program, those sort of things. So quite a lot of stuff to go on. And what we're doing with this over the next three years, we're keeping the park open, trying to run it. Um, last year, we had 140,000 visitors. I think when Simon started, what, 40,000? 40,000 when Simon first started as CEO. So in, ten, in six years, they've gone from 40 to 140. Our figures for the first two months of this year are about another 40% up on what they learned last year. So for me, it's going to be a huge logistic and operational challenge to try and keep this thing going over the next three years while we're trying to roll this pro project out. Um, but exciting times. Um, moving forward, <coughs> just give you two ticks to read that. I think Simon would, would, would echo, if you were to say this five years ago in Bletchley Park, people would have laughed at you. Um, it was a, a place that was struggling to survive. Now we're on such a, a trajectory that actually in five to ten years, I think this is absolutely a deliverable aspiration. Um, our plans for the Heritage Lottery Fund are based on a quarter of a million visitors per annum, um, and all those things in there are things that uh, we have already got plans in place to start moving, moving towards. I particularly highlight the bottom of there, the technical innovation, we have aspirations to keep linked up with academic institutes um, and people like Google to try and encourage them to, to again invest in the site, not just in terms of providing us money, but actually making use of some of the facilities to continue that innovation that went on during the war actually on the site for the future. 
and there's a number of exciting strands around that we're hoping to develop um, to say, keep technical innovation at the heart of Bletchley Park. Um, now the sales pitch, you wouldn't expect anything, anything less. Um, what can you do? As I said, we've got this, this lottery funding, but it's only scratching the surface. There's still much more to do. Um, so but if you've been inspired by what you've heard um, from Simon and, and Sue today, or indeed by your visit to the park, um, please keep spreading the word. It's a great place to come, a great story. Um, if you want to do some fundraising, there's plenty of ways we can, we can help you to think about what you might want to do. Um, as this is about Twitter, follow us. Bletchley Park is my deputy, Kelsey. Bletchley Park CEO is me, Dr. Sue Black, Sue. We all tweet as much as we can. Some of us have got more time than others to do that. We're trying to keep people informed what's going on. Um, and it says there, we want to build a Bletchley Park for the future. Um, that recognizes the international importance of the site. And if you heard what Simon said at the start, as the birthplace of the modern computer um, and the shortening of the war, this place really does deserve to be recognized for the future. So, did Twitter save Bletchley Park? Sue didn't ask the question right at the start that she should have done, which was, well, in fact, Simon's supposed to ask it. Um, you're supposed to form opinion over this, this lecture as to whether Twitter did indeed save Bletchley Park. So, um, I'll leave you to, um, to think about that one, and perhaps before we, fi we finish question time, we'll get you to put your hands up and see whether you think it did or not. For those who are Twitterers, there, there's the information. Uh, thank you very much indeed. We now move to the questions and answer sessions. Uh, so we have microphones, so if you can put your hands up. Yes, back. And, uh, Speaking to the microphone with your question, and then we'll get one of the speakers to answer. Yeah. That was um, a wonderful presentation, but I'm a bit concerned about the fact that there was no specific mention of the computer museum. I mean, I visited um, Bletchley Park a couple of years ago, and one of the reasons was because I was told that uh, Bletchley Park housed the only true computer museum in the country and one of the foremost computer museums in the world. I was just wondering what, uh, but when I went, I, I was told that it was quite underfunded and didn't actually share in the um, receipts that are taken in by Bletchley Park. I was wondering what are the specific plans for uh, the computer museum in, uh, in what you're going to do? Yeah, we have the National Museum of Computing on site. Um, it is a, um, an organization that sits within the park. It's run by a separate trust to the Bletchley Park Trust, but sits on, on our site. Um, it continues to move forward. Actually, they've just refurbished the, the Colossus Gallery in there. Um, they had it open in time for the, the opening of Turing Papers on Monday, and James May was taken around by, by Simon around that gallery. And they've done a great job in terms of restoring that. And the, gal the museum itself continues to move, move on a pace. So I say it's run by a separate trust who have their own sort of business that, that runs that. We work hand in glove with them. Um, but we are working alongside rather than the same organization. And they are an integral part of our offering, and we, we're very keen that they continue to move from strength to strength. It seems to me that for the next few years, uh, there's a, an opportunity that will not be around long, that the people who work there are still alive. So I want to know what's going on to kind of preserve some of them. In the <laughs> 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 Unfortunately, we can't renovate them and, and um, re as a, as rebuild an aside, them. As an aside, I remember as a child going on a school trip to the Edison Museum, and the tour guide was someone who had worked there with Thomas Edison, and that made a big impression on me. Absolutely. Um, some of the, the veterans still do guide, um, as Sue alluded to. Some of them are getting quite aged now and are struggling, but those who are fit and able, and I have a couple of particularly in mind who are very capable and, and I suspect they're going to go on for a number, another few years yet. They do guide um, as their sort of fitness allows. What we are doing is capturing all their memories. Um, we didn't touch on the sort of detailed history, but when the, the trust started in the early 90s, one of the first things they did was to grab all these veterans together for a farewell party. They thought that she was about to be knocked down and that's the reason they brought, brought them together. They captured their memories then. We still got those. We, we transcribed them. We're about to hopefully publish them on, on um, some various books on Kindle shortly. Um, but we continue to have an outreach program that goes out to veterans when we, when we know where they are, um, interview them, catch them on video and, and audio, and those are in our archives, which hopefully when we get to these more interactive audio-visual um, displays in museums, we'll be able to use more and more of them to tell the story. 
Awesome. And, and indeed, yesterday, I was talking with some app developers about developing a Bletchley Park app, and their stories were embedded in that as well. Also, from a social media perspective, over the last few years at the reunions, I've taken social media people up to Bletchley Park on the reunion days, and they've interviewed lots of people. So we've got loads of interviews uh, with veterans over the last few years. Well, we haven't put them up anywhere yet, but they are there, um, and we continue to do that. But, yeah, I mean, it's, it's sad because 10,000 people, I think there's, there's about 1,000... No, there's about 3,000 left. There's about 3,000 still most, alive. But they're mostly not the code breakers. <coughs> they were the people who were, yeah. uh, if you like, the, the clerical side. So th there's, there's less story uh, from them. Uh, there's a certain amount of information, but, of course, uh, the story didn't start come out until so late, so you'd lost a lot by then. I kind of like these aren't really questions they're more like points to make um, first one is a bit of promotion for uh, an organization called Young Rewired State which is um, this year it's actually going to have its sort of final show and tell at Spletchley Park at sort of a geek glass numbery and that's basically um, a hack week that's involving uh, young people around the country so uh, I just thought that would be really <laughs> just wanted to really take the opportunity to big up that because um, that's something sure. that I think a lot of people in this room should be involved with um, and second um, I'm going to definitely use this uh, Twitter saving Bletchley Park as an example when I'm confronted with people saying oh Twitter is for twits which <laughs> unfortunately, well done. unfortunately I often find myself on you know the dark the dark passages of the Daily Mail website where that sort of thing is just far too common and you know it just stopped me from going crazy um, and finally um, I think that Bletchley Park should be taught in schools as part of at least GCSE history because pretty much we get taught like um, we get taught World War II but we don't get taught this and I think that that's definitely the next step for it to be taught in schools and yeah, those are my points. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say a little bit about the interval between the Second World War and the 1990s. And if I can reminisce just a little bit. Could you repeat your question? Yeah. Um, I wanted to reminisce a little bit about the 70s um, when the site came within an ace of, of being developed. Um, at that time, it was a teacher training college. I first went there in 1974. Uh, having just gone to the Open University then. And just prior to that, I'd been in touch with, uh, an, um, well, he was a British mathematician who'd gone to America called I.J. Good. And the secrets were not quite so secret in the States. And so we learned quite a lot from him. And in fact, there was a statistician called George Barnard who was also there. And I recall the two of us and a historian at the Open University getting together and talking about it round about 1974. And the historian, who had also been doing um, some research on the Polish mathematicians prior to the war, who I, I think, if we're talking about putting it in the national curriculum, uh, we have to beware of the dangers of jingoism, as though it, it, it was completely a, a British success. I think it's quite fair to say that if it hadn't been for the Polish mathematicians in the 1930s, none of this would have happened. Um, and the, as, just coming back to the teacher training college, um, the training college wanted to actually demolish the buildings and develop the site that was there. The local council actually wanted them to have a new site in North Milton Keynes, which was what eventually happened. And so uh, if, if it were that the college had got its way, Bletchley Park, as it is now, would not be there. So I'm glad the council got its way. <laughs> More questions? Um, I was just firstly wondering uh, what grade of listing the buildings have, um, but also I was wondering which uh, audience groups have you kind of identified as being the main ones and what you're doing to kind of engage with less engaged audience groups? Do you want to start on listing? Or uh, yes, the, the, the most the majority of the buildings on the site are listed grade two, English Heritage have written a four-volume tome, it's about this thick, about that wide, on the history of each building. 
and they're actually very interested at the moment in looking at relisting uh, some of the buildings upwards so that Hut 6, for example, the one with the tarpaulins all over it, uh, potentially could be a Grade 1 listed building. Uh, and its importance is such that it probably should be. Uh, not for architectural reasons, I hasten to remember. <laughs> and I think the second part of your question, the audience, I think uh, one of the things that all museums need to try and do is to try and engage with younger people and families. Uh, and I think that's very much the focus of what the designs for the new museum have been about, to try and encourage that sort of interest, schools uh, and other younger groups. Uh, it's in common with, I think, all museums who are trying to move forward. Um, we do get, I think it's a good spread, but it is at the older end. Yeah, I mean, our, our demographic at the moment is somewhere in the region of about 46% above 60, and then a fairly even smattering across the age groups below that. So we need to do more for the younger end. Uh, in the Heritage Lottery Funding Project, for example, we're, um, once we've got the money, we'll be able to employ another teacher to do educational outreach. At the moment, most of our stuff is actually done on site, um, and it's full throughout the year. We get about 8,000 kids through the site at the moment. Um, through the Heritage Lottery funding, we're going to double that to about 16,000 a year, with a large amount of that being done off-site at schools. So that's a major challenge. Um, there's also going to be a sort of youth outreach program and aspirations to do um, adult education, sort of weekend um, seminars, that sort of stuff. So there's a huge amount to be done, um, as well as all the building work. So it's um, a, a huge ask over the next three years, um, but a, a great challenge and one that uh, looking forward to dealing with. Question. I think that was it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, thank you very much indeed for coming along this evening, giving us a tremendous uh, display of enthusiasm, expertise, and the historical context, and explaining how new social media can be actually used to a tremendous effect. As you well aware, it's a subject very close to my heart, so I do put up that uh, invest in uh, support. Let's your park again, slide again. So I'd like to formally move a vote of thanks to our three speakers this evening. Thank you very much indeed. So before you go, can I just ask you to raise your hands if you thought Twitter saved Bletchley Park? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> yes, it did. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. That's great.